Okay, welcome. So we're going to cover um, some tribes and journeys, and then we're going to cover some of Jeremiah today. The Jeremiah is very, very interesting. Um, something, some topics that I love to talk about. So I hope you'll bear with me. These can kind of be long. Um, if there's any sections of scripture that are kind of repetitive, like they're going through um, um, offerings or they're going through names, sometimes I skip forward. So if you want to read all of those names and stuff, um, you can just read them yourself later. Uh, so we're in Numbers 30. So we'll begin there. Numbers 30, uh, chapter 2. These are some of my favorite commands. They're very interesting. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. If a woman vows a vow to the Lord and binds herself by a pledge while within her father's house in her youth, and her father hears of her vow and her pledge by which she has bound herself and says nothing to her, then all her vows shall stand, and every pledge by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father opposes her on the day that he hears of it, no vow of hers, no pledge by which she has bound herself shall stand. And the Lord will forgive her because her father opposed her. If she marries a husband while under her vows or any thoughtless utterance of her lips by which she has bound herself, and her husband hears of it and says nothing to her on the day that he hears, then her vows shall stand, and her pledges by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if on the day that her husband comes to hear of it, he opposes her, then he makes void her vow that was on her and the thoughtless utterance of her lips by which she bound herself, and the Lord will forgive her. But any vow of a widow or of a divorced woman, anything by which she has bound herself, shall stand against her. And if she vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by a pledge with an oath, and her husband heard of it and said nothing to her and did not oppose her, then all her vows shall stand, and every pledge by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband makes them null and void on the day that he hears them, then whatever proceeds out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning her pledge of herself shall not stand. Her husband has made them void, and the Lord will forgive her. Any vow and any binding oath to afflict herself her husband may establish, or her husband may make void. But if her husband says nothing to her from day to day, then he establishes all her vows or all her pledges that are upon her. He has established them because he said nothing to her on the day that he heard of them. But if he makes them null and void after he has heard of them, then he shall bear her iniquity. These are the statutes that the Lord commanded Moses about a man and his wife, and about a father and his daughter while she is in her youth within her father's house. The Lord spoke to Moses. Okay, there's so much to unpack just even in this. So is, this is one of my favorite sections of scripture. I know I say that a lot. So <clears throat> I want to talk about this in the spiritual sense of being married and um, or being in a, um, a father-daughter relationship. Now, women basically will change based upon the words that you speak over them a lot of times. Um, yes, I know there's hard cases, uh, but in general. So we're always speaking to the the norm, you know, I know that there's outliers. I know that there's outliers and there's people that no matter what you do, they, they're just so rebellious that you can't fix things. Okay. I understand that. Okay. So we're speaking to in general terms. Um, if you have a healthy woman and you speak life over her, you speak beauty, beautiful words over her. You speak the scriptures over her. You read the scriptures to her. You pray with her. If you do those things, she will become more and more and more lovely and more and more beautiful, okay? Men are, men are the keepers of the word. They were given the word in the garden, okay? Adam was given in the word in the garden. Um, the woman is to be a reflection of how Adam is handling the word that he's been given. The woman is supposed to be in a perfect situation, okay? In the garden, the woman is a, re a reflection of supposed to be a reflection. I know they're not liars, you guys. I know you guys, a lot of you are thinking, well, not my wife or whatever. I get it, okay? But I'm saying in general, this is how it's supposed to work. The woman is, if you are at, if you are in the garden 
and you're Adam and you've you, you're keeping the word and you're speaking the word and you're um, managing the word well, the word that Yehovah has given you, um, your wife will flow with you and she will enhance every single thing that you do, okay? If you are being a beast in the garden and you are not listening to the word and you are not acting like the man should act in the garden setting, your wife is going to butt against you, okay? So if your wife is con continually butting against you, there's a real chance that you need to do some time away, some reflection and look at where you're, you're not, you're, where you're acting like a beast instead of acting like the image of Yehovah. So Adam and Eve are made to be in the image of Yehovah. And so if Adam is acting like a beast, um, the woman will rebel against him. Okay, that's the Ezra Kenegdo. So the Ezra Kenegdo is the suitable helper. So the Ezra Kenegdo, it's it's a warrior who runs ahead with you. That's what Ezra means. Um, but it, but it's also one that opposes you. So she flows with you and she opposes you. She flows with you and she opposes you. And it's really really dependent on the way the, the amount that you are in the garden with Yehovah. Okay. And as for women. Um, we'll look at the garden situation because all of this, this verse numbers 30 is actually really, really revel, relevant to what happened in the garden. So the woman uh, went out and ma made a, made a choice. She swore a vow with the serpent in the garden, right? She brought the fruit. She went and ate the fruit. Now you notice in Genesis, when she eats the fruit, they're not naked right away. She ate the fruit. They were still fine. Right. It's when she handed it to Adam and he ate it because he had an opportunity there to cancel her vow, to cancel what she did, because he's her covering over her. Okay. And so he had that opportunity to cancel what she did, but he never did. Okay. So what the woman did wrong is she was supposed to talk to Adam about it and say, should we eat this fruit? And they should have a discussion and they should have brought it to father. Right. And they should have decided. Right. Okay, should we bring, should, should we eat this fruit, right? No, no, father, they remember, they are supposed to remember God's word and say, no, he told us not to eat this fruit. Do we trust him? And this is actually really, really, and, and you'll see as we go through the study how this all relates and it goes on and on and on. These cycles go on and on and on, okay? So the woman brought the fruit to Adam, he didn't counsel her vow that she made with the serpent. So they weren't naked yet. But when Adam eats the fruit and he joins in the vow, instead of canceling the vow that she made with the serpent, at that moment, they get naked. Okay. At that moment, they're naked and ashamed. So it's the point where Adam doesn't cancel the vow that they, that they're naked and ashamed. Okay. You can go back and check me on this. It's Genesis two, I believe. Um, so in a spiritual sense, right. The woman, okay, women thrive, women thrive when they feel protected, secure, and like the man has life handled, and then they can thrive and they can build the home out of that. When a woman has too much on her plate and she's, she's being expected to take care of the bills, she's being expected to take care of the house, she's being expected to take care of the kids, her career, all of this stuff. And this is the lie that the enemy has sold um, women for the last 20, 30 years. It's like, you, you can't just be a mom and you no, know, you need two incomes. They've, they've kind of brought us to this place where, where, um, women supposed to, especially in my generation, it was kind of this thing that we were sold. Like you have to have it all. You have to have a great career. You have to have a beautiful family. Let's, you can't do all of that at the same time. You either have to choose to have a great career or great family. You really can't do both. You really, really can't do both. You cannot have a clean house and an amazing career, um, unless you're obviously paying for somebody else to do your housework. But I'm just saying, like, it's a lot of pressure. And, the, and that was like my generation, what we were really, really sold on. Um, and then we kind of got older. We're like, that's a lie. That's a lie from the devil. Like, you don't have to do all that. You can have a family unit and work together and um, it works a lot, a lot better. Um, so what was I saying? Okay. So women thrive in general. Okay. So I'm talking in general terms, you know, 80% of women thrive when they feel secure, safe, and that things are handled. And then they can be creative in the home space. They can be creative um, contributing to the home um, and they can create beautiful things. Okay. Men, 
creating that. So Adam was put in the garden and he was to till the garden around her, right? He was supposed to work the land around her and she was supposed to be in the land. Okay. But she, her job, her job is to till Adam. Adam's job was to till the land. Her job is to till Adam. Does that make sense? So the woman is kind of like the emotional protector, the, the spiritual protector in a way of the home where Adam is more the physical and he protects the word and he's the more logical kind of, kind of um, I hate to say that because I know people are going to rally against it, but it, in general terms, okay? So this picture is a picture of, which I want to touch on quick before we, before we move on from this part of the, the Torah portion is it is also a gospel story in here. It is a story of Yeshua in all of this, okay? So where the where Adam failed to cover Eve and protect her and, and because Adam's human too, right? Just like we're all human and we fail um, at times in our lives, we fail to cover and protect. Um, where Adam failed to do that, Yeshua became our covering, okay? So in that moment where, where Adam wasn't able to cover Eve and, and cover her sin, that's when the gospel starts that Yeshua is going to come and cover our sins. Okay. So that we can go back to the garden and that we can do things right. Right. So as we repent, as we repent, we're turning back to the garden as we repent. Every time we repent, every time we're seeking father's will on something and seeking to learn his will and eat from the tree of life, we are turning back into the garden. Okay. And so that as you walk through life and you think of it in those terms, what repentance is, is turning from trying to do things out of your own knowledge and your own strength in, and turning back to eating from the tree of life and understanding that father's word is life and truth. And, and through Yeshua, we can go back there. Okay. The saying, avenge the people of Israel and the Midianites. Afterward, you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm men from among you for the war, that they may go against Midian to execute the Lord's vengeance on Midian. You shall send a thousand from each of the tribes of Israel to the war. So there were provided out of the thousands of Israel, a thousand from each tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand from each tribe, together with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, with the vessels of the sanctuary and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. They warred against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every male. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain, Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. And they also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. And the people of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their little ones, and they took as plunder all their cattle, their flocks, and all their goods. All their cities and the places where they lived, and all their encampments they burned with fire, and took all the spoil and all the plunder, both of man and of beast. Then they brought the captives and the plunder and the spoil to Moses, and to Eleazar the priest, and to the congregation of the people of Israel, at the camp on the plains of Moab, by the Jordan at Jericho. Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the chiefs of the congregation went to meet them outside the camp. And Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds who had come from service in the war. Moses said to them, Have you let all the women live? Behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And so the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known man by lying with him. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. In camp outside the camp seven days, whoever of you has killed any person and whoever has touched any slain, purify yourselves and your captives on the third day and on the seventh day. You shall purify every garment, every article of skin, all work of goat's hair, and every article of wood. Then Eleazar the priest said to the men in the army who had gone to battle, This is a statute of the law that the Lord has commanded Moses. Only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that can stand the fire, you shall pass through the fire, and it shall be clean. 
Nevertheless, it shall also be purified with the water for impurity. And whatever cannot stand the fire, you shall pass through the water. You must wash your clothes on the seventh day, and you shall be clean. And afterward you may come into the camp. The Lord said to Moses, Take the count of the plunder that was taken, both of man and of beast, you and Eleazar the priest and the heads of the fathers' houses of the congregation, and divide the plunder into two parts, between the warriors who went out to battle and all the congregation, and levy for the Lord a tribute from the men of war who went out to battle, one out of five hundred of the people and of the oxen and of the donkeys and of the flocks. Take it from their half and give it to Eleazar the priest as a contribution to the Lord. And from the people of Israel's half, you shall take one drawn out of every fifty of the people, of the oxen, of the donkeys, and of the flocks, of all the cattle, and give them to the Levites who keep guard over the tabernacle of the Lord. And Moses and Eleazar the priest did as the Lord commanded Moses. Now the plunder... Okay, this is like a hard, it's a hard section, but I want to just, a lot of times people have a lot of questions about this stuff, and I want to say this, war is messy, no matter what, no matter what, war is messy. Um, a couple of things to just point out, just to notice, there's kind of a, there is a bit of a shadow picture of the red heifer in this. I don't know if you guys know about the red heifer, but uh, when the people are sanctifying themselves before going into the camp after war, um, because they've touched dead bodies and the red heifer is all about, you, you need to be sanctified before you enter the tabernacle. Um, so the red heifer, allu alluding to the red heifer is here when we see, um, uh verse so we're chapter two numbers 30 chapter two uh verse 24 um uh 21 to 24 so you must wash your clothes on the seventh day you shall be clean and afterwards you should come into the camp um there was a three days and the Oh, here it is, up a bit. Uh, verse 19, and camp outside the camp seven days, and whoever has killed any person who has ever touched any slain, purify yourselves and your captives on the third day and on, and on the seventh day. Um, so that is a shadow picture of the, the red heifer offering as well. You shall purify every garment, every article of skin, and all the works of goat hair and every article of wood. So just interesting um, interesting stuff and what I also find really interesting is they're talking about how the gold and the silver the bronze and the iron and the tin and the lead go through the fire but anything that cannot stand in the fire shall pass through the water so basically they're cleansing everything after war um, so they've gone to war everything gets cleansed everything gets purified um, so that they can set up the camp in a pure state right um Another thing to note it in this verse is this is the this is the section where Balaam dies. So Balaam actually ends up getting killed by the Israelites. Balaam is the one who's kind of responsible for all of this mess. Um, Balaam is the one who sent um, the women from Midian into the camp to to make the to seduce the men basically. So so Balaam gave Balak the idea that the only way that you can the only way that you can defeat Israel is to send the women in, have them seduce. Uh, and this is the same story as we see in, um, what's his name? <laughs> Samson. Delilah comes in, seduces Samson. He gets seduced and then he gives up his secret to his ability to be so strong. Okay. And his ability to be so strong was his covenant relationship with Jehovah. Same thing we see with David and Goliath. David and Goliath, David was so strong, not because he was strong and big, but because he had that covenant relationship with Jehovah. Now, what Balaam and Black did is they sent the women to the camp to destroy the camp from the inside by causing the Israelites to sin. Now, once they sin, they came out of covenant with Jehovah and they became weak and they were able to be, um, the, the plague came upon them, okay? And so we see in this verse that after um, after Pinhas has dealt with the, the plague in the camp, we see in this verse, in this section, that they're now going out and um, 
they're going to enter the land. So they've got to get rid of all the filth, right? So they're getting rid of all the filth. They're getting rid of all the, the things that are going to keep them impure. And then they're going to purify themselves before they start to head into the land, okay? And so this is interesting is that this is where we see the outcome of Balaam. The outcome of Balaam is that he, he brought this all upon himself. He started it. And now he's eating the fruit of it, which is he dies by the sword, right? So now we're just talking about the plunder that they took and how they're going to divide the plunder. You'll also see a really interesting picture of the plunder and uh, of how dividing of the plunder works um, in 2 Samuel or 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel around 25. You see how David and his mighty men, some people stayed back and fortified the camp and they kept the supplies at the camp, whereas some of the men went out and fought and battled, right? And when they came back, they divided the plunder equally. They didn't say, oh, well, we went out and fought, so we get this much plunder or whatever. We get this much stuff. Um, they always divided it equally because having people back for the camp and keeping the supplies and all of that is an important job as well, right? And then, of course, they gave the tithe to the Levites who are maintaining the tabernacle and maintaining... Um, uh, maintaining all the, the word of Yah. The remaining of the spoil that the army took was 675,000 sheep, 72,000 cattle, 61,000 donkeys, and 32,000 persons in all, women who had not known man by line with him. And the half, the portion of those who had gone out in the army, numbered 337,500 sheep and the Lord's tribute of sheep was 675. The cattle were 36,000, of which the Lord's tribute was 72. The donkeys were 30,500, of which the Lord's tribute was 61. The persons were 16,000, of which the Lord's tribute was 32 persons. And Moses gave the tribute, which was the contribution for the Lord, to Eleazar the priest, as the Lord commanded Moses. From the people of Israel's half, which Moses separated from that of the men who had served in the army, now the congregation's half was 337,500 sheep, 36,000 cattle, and 30,500 donkeys, and 16,000 persons. From the people of Israel's half, Moses took one of every 50, both of persons and of beasts, and gave them to the Levites who kept guard over the tabernacle of the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then the officers who were over the thousands of the army, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds, came near to Moses and said to Moses, Your servants have counted the men of war who are under our command, and there is not a man missing from us. And we have brought the Lord's offering, what each man found, articles of gold, armlets and bracelets, signet rings, earrings and beads, to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. And Moses and Eleazar the priest received from them the gold, all crafted articles. And all the gold of the contribution that they presented to the Lord from the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds was 16,750 shekels. The men in the army had each taken plunder for himself. And Moses and Eleazar the priest received the gold from the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and brought it into the tent of meeting as a memorial for the people of Israel before the Lord. Now the people of Reuben and the people of Gad had a very great number of livestock, and they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a place for livestock. So the people of Gad and the people of Reuben came and said to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the chiefs of the congregation, Ataroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimra, Heshbon, Eliela, Sebum, Nebo, and Beon, the land that the Lord struck down before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. And they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. But Moses said to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, Shall your brothers go to the war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land that the Lord has given them? Your fathers did this when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the people of Israel from going into the land that the Lord had given them. 
And the Lord's anger was kindled on that day, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, none except Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, and Joshua the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And behold, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all this people. Okay. Is, is our Heavenly Father a liar that he should lie? No, he is not. He's not a man that he should lie. Um, so... One thing that I have learned from actually reading the entire Bible, and so we're going to read through the Old Testament, but we're also going to, we're going to take this into the New Testament as well, but he's not a man that he should lie. So what is he saying here? Those, those who did not wholly follow him are going to get spit back out into the wilderness. Now, what do we see in the book of Revelation? In Revelation 3, we see the lukewarm those who are not wholly following him that say they're rich, they have it all figured out. We don't have to look at any of this stuff. We don't have to self-reflect. We're under grace 100%. And we don't have to do the following of Yehovah, the following of Yeshua anymore. Well, the, the New Testament argues with you on that fact. And so what we see time and time again is the people not wholeheartedly following him. What do we see when Yeshua talks about the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and might, all your strength. That is the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. So Yeshua quotes the Shema, and then love your neighbor as yourself, okay? On these two things, hang, hang. So connected to these two things. If you look at every single commandment in the Old Testament, and every single commandment in the New Testament, there's uh, 1,050 New Testament commands. There's 613-ish Old Testament commands. Most of them don't apply to us today, but a few of them do. On every single one of those commands, it's either about loving God or loving people, one or the other, okay? So when Yeshua is saying on these two things, hang all of the other commandments, he's saying that these are the two tablets, these are the two base commands, and the rest are going to be little ways of understanding that okay so if if you look at say a command feed the widow and the orphans is that loving Yehovah or loving people well it's a bit of both but you could put it in the loving people category right um so as we wholly follow him as we shema here and obey um we come into the land we cross the jordan coming into the land um back to the garden okay um, so those who are not going to wholly follow him, just like it talks about in their book of Revelation, Laodicea, they're going to get spit out, right? And so all of these things that we're looking at here, you will see them revisited in the book of Revelation when they go through the churches. There was a plague. Why was the plague? Why is the plague happening in the, in the book of Revelation on the churches, um, the plague happens because the people decide to follow Jezebel. What did we just talk about the last two weeks? We talked about Balaam and Balak, how they sent the women into the camp to deceive the Israelites into worshiping false gods, to mix up their worship, to add idolatry into their worship. And then what happens? A plague comes onto the camp. You see this exact same picture happening in the book of Revelation with the church. Um, I forget which one it is. With the church who gets the plagues. They will not repent because they've allowed Jezebel into the camp and they, they're following the, the teachings of Jezebel. The teachings of Jezebel is mix the idolatry in, mix it all in. What did Jezebel do when she was in, in, the king, in Ahab's kingdom? She brought in all the idolatry into the kingdom. She brought in all the idols, the false prophets, all of that stuff. And so that church ended up with the plagues, right? And we see that exact same pattern with Balaam and Black. They ended up with the plagues. And now we're looking at the pattern of Laodicea. Who gets, who gets kicked out in the wilderness from being in under the covering of the tabernacle and heading into the land? 
those people who are lukewarm and not full, fully following Yehovah with their whole heart and soul. They're being wishy-washy. They're being back and forth. Um, they're not believing his word, okay? And so he says here, uh, where is that verse? He says here, Surely none of the men who came out of Egypt from 20 years old and upwards shall see the land that I swore to give, give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. They have not wholly followed me. And so they're not getting the land because they're being lukewarm, right? They're not, they're not all in. Um, except for Caleb, the son of uh, Jephana and the Kezite and Josh, uh, Yehoshua, the son of Nun, they have followed, they have wholly followed Yehovah. And Yehovah's anger kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of Yehovah was gone. And behold, you have risen in your father's place, a broad, broad of sinful men to increase the more fierce anger of Yehovah against Israel. If you turn away from following him, he will abandon them in the wilderness, Laodicea, in the wilderness and destroy this people. Okay. So the same patterns that happen in the Old Testament happen in the New Testament. Things your pastor is not going to tell you. Then they came near to him and said, we will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones, but we will take up arms ready to go before the people of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones shall live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until each of the people of Israel has gained his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance has come to us on this side of the Jordan to the east. So Moses said to them, If you will do this, if you will take up arms to go before the Lord for the war, and every armed man of you will pass over the Jordan before the Lord, until he has driven out his enemies from before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then after that you shall return and be free of obligation to the Lord and to Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep, and do what you have promised. And the people of Gad and the people of Reuben said to Moses, Your servants will do as my Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our livestock, and all our cattle shall remain there in the cities of Gilead. But your servants will pass over every man who is armed for war before the Lord to battle, as my Lord orders. All right, you see a very similar picture in um, 1 Samuel 25, where the, they, the men go out to secure the land, and then they come back to the camps. Um, it's very, very interesting how these pictures kind of repeat, repeat, repeat. So what's happening here is the agreement is being made that if the men go into the land and battle for, battle for the land, then they're going to be able to come back to this, this pasture area that they wanted. And th they've decided that they like the land that's on this other side of the Jordan. Um, because they're all uh, cattle herders, they decided that they like that. And so they're kind of, Moses and them are making an agreement for that. So yes, come into battle first. And then if you want to come back after that, you can come back. So we're on numbers. 228. So Moses gave command concerning them to Eleazar the priest and to Joshua the son of Nun and to the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel. And Moses said to them, If the people of Gad and the people of Reuben, every man who is armed to battle before the Lord, will pass with you over the Jordan, and the land shall be subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead for possession. However, if they will not pass over with you armed, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. And the people of Gad and the people of Reuben answered, What the Lord has said to your servants, we will do. We will pass over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan, and the possession of our inheritance shall remain with us beyond the Jordan. 
And Moses gave to them, to the people of Gad, and to the people of Reuben, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sion, king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, the land and its cities with their territories, the cities of the land throughout the country. And the people of Gad built Dibon, Adaroth, Aror, Atroth Shofan, Jazer, Jogbaha, Beth Nimrah, and Beth Haran, fortified cities and folds for sheep. And the people of Reuben built Heshbon, Eliela, Kiriathium, Nebo, and Baalmeon. Their names were changed, and Sibma. And they gave other names to the cities that they built. And the sons of Maker, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and captured it, and dispossessed the Amorites who were in it. And Moses gave Gilead to Maker, the son of Manasseh, and he settled in it. And Jair, the son of Manasseh, went and captured their villages, and called them Havath Jair. And Noba went and captured Kenath and its villages, and called it Noba, after his own name. These are the stages of the people of Israel when they went out of the land of Egypt by their companies under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Moses wrote down their starting places, stage by stage, by command of the Lord. And these are their stages according to their starting places. They set out from Ramses in the first month, on the fifteenth day of the first month. On the day after the Passover, the people of Israel went out triumphantly in the sight of all the Egyptians, while the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom the Lord had struck down among them. On their gods also the Lord executed judgments. So the people of Israel set out from Ramses and camped at Succoth. And they set out from Succoth. Okay, I just want to stop there and point out a couple things about this. Um, on, their, on their gods, Jehovah executed judgments. So when you go into the Exodus plagues, they all are connected to one of the pagan gods that they were worshiping. And basically, Jehovah was showing the Egyptians and showing um, the Israelites and the people that were going to leave into the wilderness that these, these pagan gods were useless. They were weak. There's nothing that they could do. If Jehovah decides that he's going to do something, he's going to do it and it's going to happen. And it doesn't matter which of these little pagan gods that you um, make offerings to, right? And so like each of the, so the frogs, for example, the, the Egyptians worshiped a frog god, right? They had all these different gods that were in the Nile going red. The, the Egyptians worshiped a god that lived in the Nile. Um, so all of these different things were connected to these little gods, okay? And so Yehovah was executing judgment. And so judgment, I really, I, is a good thing to ponder on and a good thing to meditate on. Judgment is the results of whatever you've been doing. That's what judgment is. So when judgment comes upon you, it is like, like he said, going back to Noah, Noah gets off the boat right? Noah gets off the boat. He makes an offering to Yehovah and Yehovah says to him, whatever seed you plant into the earth, it's going to grow and it's going to grow to completion. Okay. So judgment is your seed that you have been planting growing to completion, completion. Okay. So when Yehovah executes judgments, he's letting the fruits of your own, your own choices come to fruition. Okay. Um, and that's, that's, that idea of judgment, okay? Um, he's given us the map, the plan, the standard, the way that things work. He's telling us, okay, this is the way things work, right? Um, this is the way marriage works. This is the way having kids works. This is all of this stuff, right? Um, so if we choose to deviate from that and go a different direction, let's just take a really simple example. Let's say that you want to fornicate and um, that's your thing, okay? If you decide that that's your thing and you're going to keep doing that, you're not going to fight against it, um, you're not going to fight against, you know, corn, all of that stuff, and you're just going to fornicate, fornicate, fornicate. The fruit of that will be in your relationships in your life. You will not have a good marriage, guaranteed. You will not have a good family life, guaranteed. So the fruit of that will grow out of your life. Even if you're a young person and you're not married yet, the fruit of those actions, the fruit of those decisions is going to, is going to continually to grow, okay? 
Um, but if you decide to focus more on um, being a good steward of the body that you've been given, being a good steward of the life that you've been given, um, choosing good people to be in your life, choosing people that are full of wisdom to be in your life, the fruit of that will grow in your life, right? <clears throat> that is judgment. Judgment is happening all the time. Judgment is happening all the time, okay? Um, the second thing I want to point out that was really, really interesting that a lot of people miss is uh, verse five. So we're numbers 30, are we in numbers 30? Numbers 33, one, five. Okay. So the people of Israel set out from Ramses. So they're leaving Egypt. They left Ramses and they camped at Sukkoth. Okay. Sukkoth, it, we have a feast, a fall feast, and it's called Sukkoth, right? It is the feast of tabernacles. And so in the feast of tabernacles, you have the image of the wedding feast, but then you also have the image of, um, when the people left Egypt, like I said, these patterns repeat, they camped at Sukkoth first, okay? Sukkoth was a place that Jacob had built, um, and he had made, he'd made coverings for his cattle. <clears throat> so I've talked about this several times before, about how cattle is often used. You see it in the book of Jonah. Cattle is often used to describe what the, what the Lord, Jehovah, has acquired. And so he's acquired things and put them under a covering, Okay. And so this image here is uh, Jehovah has brought the people out of, out of Egypt and he's put them under a covering right away, right? And you notice in Exodus, when the people start to do their journey and they start to travel, there's this one spot where Jehovah is like, oh, don't take the people this way. They're not ready for that battle yet. You know, um, so he's putting the people under his covering to begin their journey in the wilderness but he's also protecting them from battles they can't handle yet, okay? He's going to bring them into battles eventually. He's going to teach them how to battle eventually. But when they first start, he needs to teach them and show them how to walk, how to trust him, how to hear his voice, all of those, all of those things. And we see that in our own walk, right? We get saved by grace through faith, and we get put under the covering. And then he teaches us how to walk with them, how to walk in the wilderness with them, eating the manna every single day. And, the, you know, the manna from heaven, these little understandings that we get from heaven every single day. And we learn and walk with him, right? And then as we walk with him, we become stronger and stronger and stronger. And then he has us go to war with bigger things, not necessarily personal things, but, you know, for somebody like me who's been walking with him for a while, I go to war and I come on here and I and I discuss these things with you. That is that is me going to war, right? Um, that is me picking up my sword, which is the word, which is the word. This is my sword, and coming to war, right? Whereas a new believer doesn't necessarily have the ability. They don't have a very big sword yet. They don't have a big understanding of this, so their battles are going to be smaller in in nature, right? And then as you walk and grow your battles will get bigger, your responsibilities will get bigger, you'll get, be given more to manage and more to handle, your ministry will grow. Even if your ministry is just your family, even if your ministry is just your community or whatever, you don't have, everyone has a different type of ministry. Some people's ministry is only to their family. Some people's ministry is only to one child, right? And then some people's ministry is uh, to many people, right? So I just wanted to point out that picture because it's really, really interesting to see that the people went directly under the covering of Yehovah. And that we talked about before how the people, often the people were under threat of being kicked out of that covering. And we see that also in, <clears throat> excuse me. We see that also in the book of Revelation when Laodicea gets spit out. What are they getting spit out of? They're getting spit out of that covering, that protection. Um, because they are not wholly following Yehovah, just like the people in the wilderness got spit out and they got spit back into the wilderness, right? And, and the people who were wholly following Yehovah got led into the land. And then we see that also in the Church of Philadelphia. The Church of Philadelphia is told that they have the endurance. Now, the endurance is found in Revelation 14, 12, which is the testimony of Yeshua, so the testimony of their salvation and the commandments of Yehovah. So because they have that endurance, those two things, 
um, and they were wholly following Yahovah, they were kept under the covering, right? So Philadelphia is the picture of the people being kept under the covering. Laodicea in the book of Revelation is the people getting spit out of the covering. And so we're looking here at the people being put under the covering. And it doesn't matter how much they knew, how they were just saved. These people were just saved and they're put under the covering, okay? We all get put under the covering right away. But when we're rebellious and we rebel against the word and we're not, uh, we're not looking to submit ourselves to the word, submit ourselves to Yeshua in every area of our life, we can get spit out of the covering. So a really tangible example of this would be, let's go back to the fornication example, because it's a really simple visual, you know, it's easy for everyone to understand the fornication example. You could be saved and be put under the covering of Yehovah. But if you keep doing fornication and you keep doing these things and, bring, and planting these seeds, you're going to get spit out of that covering, right? You're not going to have that peace. You know, every time you do that, you're going to have, you're going to lose your peace. You're going to lose your connection to Yehovah. You're going to have to repent and turn back. And you can always repent and turn back until the day you die. But you know, eventually he's just going to leave you to your means, right? If your desire is more for that than him, he's going to let you have what you desire. He's going to give you what you serve, right? Carrying on. So we're at Numbers 33, uh, around verse 5. And camped at Etham, which is on the edge of the wilderness. And they set out from Etham and turned back to Pihahirath, which is east of baal Zephon. And they camped before Migdal. And they set out from before Hahirath and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness. And they went a three days journey in the wilderness of Etham and camped at Merah. And they set out from Merah and came to Elam. At Elam there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they camped there. And they set out from Elam and camped by the Red Sea. And they set out from the Red Sea and camped in the wilderness of Sin. And they set out from the wilderness of Sin and camped at Dothka. And they set out from Dothka and camped at Elush. And they set out from Elush and camped at Rephidim, where there was no water for the people to drink. And they set out from Rephidim and camped in the wilderness of Sinai. And they set out from the wilderness of Sinai and camped at Kibroth Ateva. And they set out from Kibroth Ateva and camped at Hazaroth. And they set out from Hazaroth and camped at Rithma. And they set out from Rithma and camped at Rimon Pires. And they set out from Rimon Pires and camped at Libna. And they set out from Libna and camped at Rissa. And they set out from Rissa and camped at Kealatha. And they set out from Kealatha and camped at Mount Shefer. And they set out from Mount Shefer and camped at Harada. And they set out from Harada and camped at Makiloth. And they set out from Makiloth and camped at Teath. And they set out from Teath and camped at Tira. And they set out from Tira and camped at Mithka. And they set out from Mithka and camped at Heshmona. And they set out from Heshmona and camped at Mosiroth. And they set out from Mosiroth and camped at Benejaikin. And they set out from Benejaikin and camped at Horheg Gidgad. And they set out from Horheg Gidgad and camped at Jotbatha. And they set out from Jotbatha and camped at Abrona. And they set out from Abrona and camped at Ezion Geber. And they set out from Ezion Geber and camped in the wilderness of mm -hmm. Zin, that is, Kadesh. And they set out from Kadesh and camped at Mount Hor on the edge of the land of Edom. And Aaron the priest went up Mount Hor at the command of the Lord and died there in the fortieth year after the people of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt on the first day of the fifth month. And Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. And the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev in the land of Canaan, heard of the coming of the people of Israel. And they set out from Mount Hor and camped at Zalmona. And they set out from Zalmona and camped at Punah. And they set out from Punan and camped at Oboth. And they set out from Oboth and camped at Aya Abara, the territory of Moab. And they set out from Ayim and camped at Dibon Gad. And they set out from Dibon Gad and camped at Elmon Diblatham. And they set out from Elmon Diblatham and camped in the mountains of Abram before Nebo. And they set out from the mountains of Abram 
and camped in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. They camped by the Jordan from Beth Jeshemoth as far as Abel Shittim in the plains of Moab. Okay, yeah, I don't have much to say about that, but I actually think it would be interesting if somebody ever did a study on each one of those places and the names and what the names mean. I think there's probably some, some very interesting insights in there. Um, so we're at Numbers 33, verse 50 now. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their metal images and demolish all their high places. And you shall take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it. You shall inherit the land by lot according to your clans. To a large tribe you shall give a large inheritance, and to a small tribe you shall give a small inheritance. Wherever the lot falls for anyone, that shall be his. According to the tribes of your fathers you shall inherit. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then those of them whom you let remain shall be as barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. And I will do to you as I thought to do to them. The okay, thorns in your sides. This is the point um, that I need to point out that this is the only place where thorn in the side has been talked about other than when Paul talks about his thorn in the side. Now, remember that Paul is a Pharisee. He knows this stuff inside and out, right? So when Paul, so a lot of people are like, well, Paul had an injury that couldn't be healed, da, da, da. No, Paul's, it, it, scripture, scripture explains scripture, okay? If Paul is talking, he's probably using a scripture term, right? And so when he's talking about the thorns in his side, he is likely talking about an inhabitant that has been left in the land, a pagan inhabitant that is being basically a pain to him. Um, so what does it say? But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, then those of whom you shall let remain shall be as barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They shall trouble you in the land which you dwell. Now, this is why Jehovah says, as you go into the land that he's giving you, that you remove all the idolatry, you remove all the false worship. You don't let that stuff exist in the land that he's giving you. Why? Because it ends up bringing you um, pain and suffering in the future. And that is why he's so strict about getting rid of all of it. Okay. You leave just a little bit. And then all of a sudden one of your kids gets into witchcraft or something like that because they saw an idol and they decide, Oh, well, I'm going to do this witchcraft thing instead of following Yehovah and boom, you've just lost in a generation. We see that happening all around us, right? So much of this idolatry was left and allowed to happen and take root and you know nobody wanted to speak against it and now it's just rampant everywhere right um <clears throat> so there's your thorn in the side if you if, if anybody ever asks you if, if anybody ever is talking about paul um and his thorn in the side remind them of numbers uh 33 verse 55 so we're at numbers 34 now Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you for an inheritance, the land of Canaan as defined by its borders. Your south side shall be from the wilderness of Zin alongside Edom, and your southern border shall run from the end of the salt sea on the east. And your border shall turn south of the ascent of Akrabim and cross to Zin, and its limit shall be south of Kadesh Barnea. Then it shall go on to Hazar Adar and pass along to Asmon. And the border shall turn from Asmon to the brook of Egypt, and its limit shall be at the sea. For the western border, you shall have the great sea and its coast. This shall be your western border. This shall be your northern border. From the great sea, you shall draw a line to Mount Hor. From Mount Hor, you shall draw a line to Lebo Hamath, and the limit of the border shall be at Zedad. Then the border shall extend to Ziphron, and its limit shall be at Hazar Enon. This shall be your northern border. You shall draw a line for your eastern border from Hazar Enon to Shephem. And the border shall go down from Shephem to Ribla on the east side of Ain. And the border shall go down and reach to the shoulder of the Sea of Kinnereth on the east. 
and the border shall go down to the Jordan, and its limit shall be at the Salt Sea. This shall be your land as defined by its borders all around. Moses commanded the people of Israel, saying, This is the land that you shall inherit by lot, which the Lord has commanded to give to the nine tribes and to the half-tribe. For the tribe of the people of Reuben by fathers' houses and the tribe of the people of Gad by their fathers' houses have received their inheritance, and also the half-tribe of Manasseh. The two tribes and the half-tribe have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan east of Jericho toward the sunrise. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, These are the names of the men who shall divide the land to you for inheritance. Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun. You shall take one chief from every tribe to divide the land for inheritance. These are the names of the men of the tribe of Judah, Caleb the son of Jephunneh, of the tribe of the people of Simeon, Shimuel the son of Amihud, of the tribe of Benjamin, Elida the son of Kislan, of the tribe of the people of Dan, a chief, Bukai the son of Joglai, of the people of Joseph, of the tribe of the people of Manasseh, a chief, Aniel, the son of Ephod, and of the tribe of the people of Ephraim, a chief, Kemuel, the son of Shiftan, of the tribe of the people of Zebulun, a chief, Elizaphan, the son of Parnak, of the tribe of the people of Issachar, a chief, Paltiel, the son of Azan, and of the tribe of the people of Asher, a chief, Ahihud, the son of Shilomi, of the tribe of the people of Naphtali, a chief, Padahal, the son of Amihud. These are the men whom the Lord commanded to divide the inheritance for the people of Israel in the land of Canaan. The Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Command the people of Israel to give to the Levites some of the inheritance of their possession as cities for them to dwell in. And you shall give to the Levites pasture lands around the cities. The cities shall be theirs to dwell in, and their pasture lands shall be for their cattle and for their livestock and for all their beasts. The pasture lands of the cities, which you shall give to the Levites, shall reach from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits all around. And you shall measure outside the city on the east side 2,000 cubits, and on the south side 2,000 cubits, and on the west side 2,000 cubits, and on the north side 2,000 cubits, the city being in the middle. This shall belong to them as pasture land for their cities. The cities that you give to the Levites shall be the six cities of refuge, where you shall permit the manslayer to flee, and in addition to them you shall give 42 cities. All the cities that you give to the Levites shall be forty-eight with their pasture lands. And as for the cities that you shall give from the possession of the people of Israel, from the larger tribes you shall take many, and from the smaller tribes you shall take few. Each in proportion to the inheritance that it inherits shall give of its cities to the Levites. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person without intent may flee there. The cities shall be for you a refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation for judgment, and the cities that you give shall be your six cities of refuge. You shall give three cities beyond the Jordan, and three cities in the land of Canaan to be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the people of Israel, and for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills any person without intent may flee there. Okay, I just want to explain the cities of refuge really quick, <coughs> um, in case you haven't heard about the cities of refuge before. So the cities were set up so that if you had an accident, if you had accidentally killed somebody, um, if you had, remember they didn't have jails, right? They didn't have jails. They had stoning um, and then they had uh, other things, but they didn't have, like if you, if you were found guilty of murder, you were stoned to death, you know, you didn't go to jail for your life, okay? For the rest of your life. Um, so the cities of refuge were for people who had accidentally killed somebody. So your driving on your donkey, you run over somebody by accident, 
obviously not a true example, but you accidentally kill somebody. Something happens, there's an accident, somebody dies and it's your fault. You didn't mean to do it though. So you're not a murderer, but you've killed this person. Um, so the person might want to avenge the death. Somebody in the family might want to avenge the death. You gotta remember that this is ancient Middle East, okay? So we have to really look at it from the lens of this is ancient Middle East. Um, so the person might want to avenge your death. So in order that the person doesn't avenge your death, you're sent away to the city of refuge. And that's where these people can go and they can live out their lives until the day of judgment. Um, believe it's later on. I can't remember exactly where it talks about. You are in the city of refuge until the high priest changes. So as when there's a new high priest, you can come out of the city of refuge and you can come back into the congregation. And I believe that that's a really, really beautiful shadow picture of Yeshua bringing the people back through forgiveness, through reconciliation, through restoration of the kingdom. So as Yeshua became our high priest, the people who, you know, we're talking in spiritual terms, the people who are in spiritual refuge, they had made mistakes, they had, they had sinned against their brothers, whether, you know, and they were able to come back into they were able to come back into the congregation. Does that make sense? Kind of an interesting perspective on it. Um, so yeah, you were in the city of refuge until the high priest was changed and then everyone would come back as the high priest was changed. I believe, don't quote me on that because that's, I'm just going from memory on that, but I believe it's further on. We'll read about that. But if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. And if he struck him down with a stone tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Or if he struck him down with a wooden tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. The avenger of blood shall himself put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. And if he pushed him out of hatred or hurled something at him, lying in wait so that he died, or in enmity struck him down with his hand so that he died, then he who struck the blow shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. But if he pushed him suddenly without enmity, or hurled anything on him without lying in wait, or used a stone that could cause death, and without seeing him dropped it on him so that he died, Though he was not his enemy and did not seek his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood in accordance with these rules. And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he had fled, and he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the boundaries of his city of refuge to which he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the boundaries of his city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. For he must remain in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. And these things shall be for a statute and rule for you throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. And you shall accept no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. You shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. The he okay, that's interesting. I just noticed that as well. Um... So the high priest, the death of the high priest is acting as a covering over the land to avenge for all the death and destruction that had happened. So once the high priest dies, that's the covering. So that's also a very beautiful picture of Yeshua. Um, 
and it's the covering and it allows it allows the blood guilt to be dealt with the high priest dying um, and that transition allows he acts as the covering and which is really interesting because we had talked about in the beginning of this portion how the husband acts as a covering over the wife so if a wife does certain things um, makes vows with her mouth her, her husband can cancel those vows right and so this is a really really This is a really, really interesting um, picture of that as well. It's the, this idea of being covered by another um, and how Yeshua becomes our covering as well, right? By covering, and you know, the, the covering is the tabernacle picture as well, right? We talked about how the people went from Ramsey to Sukkot under the covering, under the dwelling, um, they get covered by Yehovah, okay? That's what grace is. It's the covering. It, grace is the covering for you to figure life out um, and so that you can be, that your sins are covered, that you're, not, grace is not the, grace is not for you to act belligerent and not seek Yehovah's truth on a matter. Grace is the covering while you figure out and make mistakes, which are a natural part of life. So grace is the covering that you come under in order to walk out this life with Yehovah, walk with him in the garden, asking his opinion on things. So there's this verse in Proverbs where it says, those who turn away from hearing the Torah, hearing the instructions and teachings of Yehovah, um, those, those people, their prayer is an abomination. Why is their prayer an abomination? Well, because they're seeking his grace and covering, but they're not seeking his instruction. They're not seeking what he says on a matter, but they just want his grace and covering. They want to be on, in the tent, but they don't want to behave by the tent rules, right? They don't want to see what Yehovah has to say about how you stay in the tent. Um, and that's why your prayer becomes an abomination. So let's look at, like, let's look at an example of this. Um, oh, no. My computer just did something. So the computers. Okay. Uh, let's look at an example of this. Uh, let's say you have chronic money issues. You have chronic money issues. Um, but you're just praying for miracles all the time with money, praying for miracles, praying for miracles, praying for miracles. But you never consult what the word has to say about managing what's been given to you. You never consult what the word has to say about how you should handle these things. But you just keep praying for miracles. You keep overspending. You keep being lazy you keep not going and working you keep doing all of these things um mismanaging your money spending it on things that you don't need and instead of actually consulting the word and seeing how Yehovah wants you to handle these things you just keep praying for miracles right that is an abomination you're being disrespectful to the word of Yehovah you're being disrespectful to his grace right let's look at another example a very very hot topic let's look at the, the topic of food let's say you keep getting sick and you keep getting uh, diseases and you keep having all this stuff happen, but you are absolutely in rebellion to how Yehovah, Yehovah says to treat your body like a temple. And you keep praying for miracles. And yes, Yehovah gives miracles and he gives grace and he gives second chances. But if you, if you keep abusing your body, um, doing drugs or doing alcohol all the time or eating really um, horrible foods, if you keep doing that to your body and your body starts to break down and deteriorate and then you're praying for miracles all the time you're praying for healing all the time you're praying for miracles but you're not um listening to his wise words in his scriptures about how to treat your body how to eat how to take care of yourself then your prayer becomes an abomination you're just asking for miracles but you're not willing to seek his counsel and his wisdom within his word and that's why it becomes an abomination all right, so we're at Numbers 36.1. Numbers 36.1. Heads of the fathers' houses of the clan of the people of Gilead, the son of Maker, son of Manasseh, from the clans of the people of Joseph, came near and spoke before Moses and before the chiefs, the heads of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel. They said, The Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for inheritance by lot to the people of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, to his daughters. But if they are married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the people of Israel, then their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. So it will be taken away from the lot of our inheritance. And when the jubilee of the people of Israel comes, 
then their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry, and their inheritance will be taken from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. And Moses commanded the people of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the people of Joseph is right. This is what the Lord commands concerning the daughters of Zelophehad. Let them marry whom they think best, only they shall marry within the clan of the tribe of their father. The inheritance of the people of Israel shall not be transferred from one tribe to another, for every one of the people of Israel shall hold on to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the people of Israel shall be wife to one of the clan of the tribe of her father, so that every one of the people of Israel may possess the inheritance of his fathers. So no inheritance shall be transferred from one tribe to another, for each of the tribes of the people of Israel shall hold on to its own inheritance. The daughters of Zelophehad did as the Lord commanded Moses, for Mala, Tirzah, Hogla, Milcah, and Noah, the daughters of Zelophehad, were married to sons of their father's brothers. They were married into the clans of the people of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in the tribe of their father's clan. These are the commandments and the rules that the Lord commanded through Moses to the people of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. Okay, so that's just the inheritance laws. Um, a lot of the Torah is legal structure. So if you were a lawyer and you read a law book, um, that is a lot of what you're, you're looking at is the legal structure of a nation. Um, so just just some an, another way to understand. So a lot of times we're reading this stuff and just like, I don't understand why this is in here. Well, it is the legal document of how the country runs. Just like if you would go to your local your local um, library and look up a legal document for your country, the laws of your country, there would be certain laws and certain ways that their things are done there, right? So that's what a lot of that is. Um, we're going to go to the Haftarah, which is Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 2, 4. So a little background on Jeremiah before we start. Jeremiah was a prophet, um, to Israel, and he was actually uh, he was actually in a refuge position. He was sent away. He was a Levite who was sent away. He was one, one of the priesthood who was sent away and was no longer be, be no longer able to serve in the temple anymore. Um, I can't remember the exact terms in which why he was sent away, but he was outside of Israel. He was very young. Um, he wasn't an older man, and he was sent by Yehovah, just like Isaiah was sent by Yehovah to tell the people to repent. The people who were running the temple, they were running all of that stuff. He, he was sent to tell the elders to repent. So he, here's this young man, he's been in exile, and he's been brought into the council of Yehovah, brought into the heavenly council, the heavenly court, and he is being told that he needs to go tell these old men who run things to repent. So just to give you some imagery of a, about who Jeremiah is. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt? who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through where no man dwells. And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, I still contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children's children I will contend. For cross to the coasts of Cyprus and see, or send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? 
but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Is Israel a slave? Is he a home-born servant? Why then has he become a prey? The lions have roared against him. They have roared loudly. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without inhabitant. Moreover, the men of Memphis and Toppenes have shaved the crown of your head. Have you not brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? And now what do you gain by going to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Your evil will chastise you and your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. For long ago I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree you bowed down like a whore. Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord God. How can you say, I am not unclean, I have not gone after the bales? Look at your way in the valley, know what you have done, a restless young camel running here and there, a wild donkey used to the wilderness in her heat sniffing the wind. Who can restrain her lust? None who seek her need weary themselves. In her month they will find her. Keep your feet from going unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said, it is hopeless, for I have loved foreigners, and after them I will go. As a thief is shamed when caught, so the house of Israel shall be shamed. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, and their prophets, who say to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone, you gave me birth. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they say, arise and save us. But where are your gods that you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in your time of trouble. For as many as your cities are your gods, O Judah. Okay, lots to unpack here. Um, so let's go. I just want to point out a few key things. Um, just want to point out a few key things. I think we'll have to kind of start at the beginning. Um, uh, let's look at Jeremiah 2 verse, Jeremiah 2 verse 7. I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruit and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. So, <clears throat> The heritage, the history, the things that Jehovah has done through his people, um, those are his stories, his, that's his works, okay, his works. And so when people come into the land of his works, and they defile it with different things that don't have anything to do with his works, they create up feasts, they create feasts and festivals, they create these ideas that are not based on the heritage of his works. They are creating their own works, right? They're, they're worshiping the works of their own hands, okay? And this is the same thing that we've gone through quite a bit in the last two weeks as we talk about the mixing, the, the, the whoredom that comes into the camp and all that mixing. And what is that's doing is diluting the waters, the pure waters of his word, and it's diluting and confusing the waters. Now we talked about the lukewarmness, right? You see these pictures that go through scripture. And as you start to read more and more scripture, you'll notice that these themes repeat themselves. So lukewarmness is the mixing of these waters. And here in this verse, Jeremiah is talking about the pure waters, but no, you've gone, these people have gone to the phrase and they've gone to uh, Assyria. So that's the, 
It's the idea of drinking from the waters of the pagan nations, okay? And so as these people are drinking from the waters of the pagan nations and they're bringing it into the camp, what are they doing? They're causing those waters to be mixed and lukewarm. It is the same picture that we see in Revelation of the lukewarm church who has been mixing the waters, okay? They say everything's fine, they're good, they're rich, but they've been mixing the waters. They've been drinking from Assyria. They've been drinking from the Euphrates um, rather than drinking from the cisterns, the pure cisterns of the living water of Jehovah, the heritage. They've made the heritage an abomination. We see that so much in the church today. Um, not every church, obviously. In many churches we see today that where they make all of this that we're talking about today, all of this that we're looking at today, these symbols, these themes that Jehovah has created for us to understand him. So he's created these symbols and these pictures for us to, to have a heritage that we can understand so that we have a pattern and a picture. And this is his works, okay? But instead, um, a lot of times they take the, the heritage of other people's works, right? Outside of the scriptures. And they make his heritage an abomination by mixing all of that together. Hopefully that makes that sense. Um, the priests did not say, where is Jehovah? Those who handled the law, Torah, did not know me. Their shepherd, the shepherds transgress, transgressed against me. The prophets, prophets prophesied by Baal. So what is prophesying by Baal? They're not prophesying from the word. What is prophecy? Prophecy is speaking the word of Jehovah. Now, if you're speaking the word of Jehovah and you're, or you're saying that you're speaking the word of Jehovah, but it's contradicting what the scriptures are actually saying and teaching, and you're not looking to go back to the scriptures and look at word by word, line by line, and say, okay, what is the heritage of Jehovah? What has he told us in the past? Is what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing matching that? So these prophets that are prophesying, but their prophecies are not looking at the scripture and they're not, they're not um, walking through line by line and going back to the heritage. Um, they are just prophesying by Baal. They're prophesying by their own thoughts, their own imaginations, their own works. Okay. And so you cannot go wrong. You cannot go wrong if you always just go back to the scriptures line by line. You don't need any fanciful things. You don't need any fanciful revelations. Abba will give you revelation through the scripture, okay? Um, and if, if you go just into the heritage of the word even, I always like to go back into the just word by word by word and look at the word and see how the word is built, see what it is built upon, see the history of the word, where is it first used, all of these things. And as you do that, you will get a really good picture of what Jehovah is trying to say. He's not making up new words in, you know, in Revelation. He's not making up new ideas. He's He's reminding you that he's already told you these things, okay? He's reminding you that his word does not come back void. If he has said he's going to do something, if he said he's going to spit out the lukewarm, he's going to spit out the lukewarm. And no amount of greasy grace preaching is going to change that because Jehovah has said he's going, to speak, he's going to spit out the lukewarm, right? Um, <clears throat> so they're prophesying. When you are prophesying and you are speaking and it is not lining up with the word, you are prophesying by Baal. You're prophesying by a fake God that you have made up, okay? If a God of stone or wood or whatever that you have made up um, because you are not prophesying by the word of Yehovah. If you are speaking things that are in the name of Yehovah, but you are not speaking them, the things that agree with Yehovah, with what he has said in the past, then you are prophesying by your own gods. That's period, end story. There's no, there's no debate on that. Um, so, so if you see a, a prophet, I'm using air quotes, if you see a prophet who is prophesying, but yet they say, turn away from the law, uh, turn away from the instructions of Yehovah, do not consult the instructions of Yehovah, that stuff is done away with. That prophet is prophesying not the word of Yehovah, that prophet is prophesying of their own gods, their flesh, whatever, whatever gods they have that they have set up on high. Um, whether that be literal or spiritual, they are prophesying by those things. And we are warned about these prophets time and time again through the scriptures. And that's, that's why I come on here and I do these, these things because I want you guys to see that this is not a new thing. This is people deciding that they're going to turn away from Jehovah and his wise instructions and all of that stuff. This is not a new thing. This is the pattern that's gone on and on and on and on and on again. So when you see people doing this pattern again, 
you can just be like, oh, there's that pattern again, they're doing it, right? And it, it won't confuse you anymore. Like why, why are these people preaching this? You don't have to consult Jehovah's word for how you live your life anymore. Well, they're preaching it because they're acting just as these Israelites acted. They were, they were brought into the kingdom. They were brought near, they were once far off, but they were brought near to the nation of Israel, but they, but they instead defiled the land and made the heritage an abomination, just like uh, Jeremiah is saying here, I brought you into a plentiful land. They, I was, you were once far off. I brought you near to Israel. You were brought near into a plentiful land. But when you came in, you defiled that land and made my heritage an abomination. You see this. You see this happening today right before your eyes, okay? Uh, so I want to just touch on quickly before we move on. Uh, verse 13. So we're in Jeremiah 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves. Okay. So there's always this speak of our works versus his works. Okay. If you want to know what his works are, it's found in the word. Okay. Anything that's found in the word is his works. Anything that you are making out, making up outside of the word is your works. Okay. So if you have a person who is, is preaching works outside of the word, they're hewing, hewing their own cisterns instead of drinking from the fountain of living water. Okay. So, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word was, the, the word was with Yehovah and the word was Yehovah. So the fountain of living water is that salvation that comes through the word. Okay. Um, that is Yeshua. Um, in physical form, obviously, but it's also the salvation that comes from, from being a partaker of the living waters, right? And having those living waters flow through you. And now in the Feast of Sukkot, when you have Yeshua in the temple and he's saying, come to me and I will give you the living waters, stay under the tabernacle, okay? So he's at the Feast of Sukkot and he's saying, stay under the tabernacle, be with me underneath the tabernacle and have the living waters. He also says that you can get spit out. He's saying that you, you want to come and partake within the tabernacle, but he's also saying you can, you can get spit out. And so as we talk about these fountains of living waters, we don't want to hewn out our own cistern of living water, this made up thing that we are inventing, right? The living water comes from the word of Yehovah. It doesn't come up from, come from made up things that we are inventing. So we always want to go back to the word and check out whatever people are saying, um, that whatever they're saying, um, holds water. So where does that saying come from that it holds water, right? Uh, could, could possibly that saying, does it hold water comes from right here. Because it's saying, for my people have committed two evils, they've forsaken me the fountain of living waters and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that hold no water. So you have to check if the cistern that someone is preaching to you holds water. How do you check? Does it line up with the word? If it lines up with the word, that cistern is not a cistern that they've hewn out themselves, but is the cistern um, that holds water, which is um, hewn out by Yehovah. Uh, let's go down a little bit further. And just to bring this point home, we go to verse 18, uh, Jeremiah 2, verse 18. Now, what do you gain by going to Egypt and drinking the waters of the Nile? And what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Okay, so this is speaking to that lukewarm thing that we've been talking about throughout this whole, this whole Bible study is these people going to these different places. Okay, so let's look at Exodus, right? People go to Exodus to drink the waters of Exodus that have nothing to do with the scriptures, right? Have nothing, they're drinking the water of Exodus rather than drinking the water of Sukkot, okay? Now, Sukkot is the feast that we are commanded to save up for and enjoy in Jerusalem every single year so that the so that it rains upon us, right? Uh, that's in Zechariah 14. But Sukkot is commanded in scripture that you are supposed to put aside a, a tithe so that you can go to do Sukkot. And so you can take that time off and attend to Sukkot. Now, we have all these believers all over the place that instead of um, coming to the... Feast of Tabernacles, where they tabernacle with the people, um, they instead go and, and save up their money and do Xmas, 
which has nothing to do with tabernacles, right? And so they're going against the command and they're creating their own cistern, but that cistern doesn't hold living water. That cistern, this is why we see the pagans doing the Xmas. We saw, we see everybody uh, saying like, this, this isn't your biblical festival. This is a pagan festival because they're right. Those pagans are right. They're, they're saying, this is our festival. This is, has to do with Yule. It has to do with all these other things. It has nothing to do with Christianity. And they are correct. They are correct. And so that cistern is, it's like you're drinking from the waters of Egypt. You're drinking from the waters of Assyria and you're going to be left thirsty, right? Why do we have so many thirsty Christians putting up thirst traps on TikTok and Instagram? I thought you were a Christian. Why are you putting up thirst traps, right? Because they're thirsty. They're not drinking the actual living water. They're drinking from a cistern that they've hewn out with their own hands rather than coming to the living waters at Sukkot, okay? So now if you look in the book of Luke, You'll see Yeshua, he's at the Feast of Sukkot, and he says, come to me and drink the living waters. Now, if Yeshua is the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, then why are we going other places than the word to drink, right? Why are you drinking at Xmas? Why are you drinking at Easter, right? Why are you drinking those waters instead of drinking the word, right? I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit of a rant there. Um, so what is he saying? Why are you going to these waters and drinking? Your evil will chastise you. Your apostasy will reprove you. Because you're forsaking Yehovah when you do that. For long ago, I broke your yoke and burst your bonds. But you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill, a high hill and every green tree, you bowed down like a whore. No, there's, so whoredom, <laughs> we're going on a tangent today. Whoredom in the scripture is linked to intimacy. Uh, so you're sharing your intimacy with other things. Um, you know, within a marriage, you could share your intimacy other places. Like, let's look at the Instagram example. Let's say you are married, you're a woman, but you're very beautiful and you go on Instagram and you're showing your goods on Instagram and it bothers your husband. That's whoredom. Even though you're not going out and acting in that way, you are, you're acting you're, you're acting in a way that is disrespectful to your husband, okay? Now, same thing goes with if your husband, same thing goes if your husband's on Instagram or whatever, and he's looking at all these pictures of all these different women. He's acting like a whore, right? And that's whoredom, right? So whoredom is used as a way to describe spiritual idolatry in the scriptures as well. So in the scriptures, they describe spiritual idolatry all as whoredom, because you're sharing your intimacy, you're sharing your spiritual intimacy with things that have nothing to do with Yehovah, right? So when you're doing these, these pagan feasts and these pagan festivals, and you're bringing all these pay, you're sharing that spiritual intimacy. It's like you're going on spiritual Instagram, and you're liking bikini pictures, okay? And instead of keeping your, your marriage to Yehovah pure, and keeping it set apart, you are defiling it with all this other other stuff that has nothing to do with it, right? And so you see, even in this picture here, he's saying under every green tree, you're bowing down like a whore, right? So you're going up on a high heel. High heel is a picture of, a high heel is a picture of going up in worship and you're bowing down behind under every green tree, right? Yet I planted you a choice vine who holy of pure seed. And then you have turned degenerate and become a wild vine, right? Okay, moving on. Um, yeah, I think you guys get the point. If you've watched the last few weeks, I think you know kind of the picture that's being painted repeatedly here. Let's go on to Jeremiah 3, 4. And Jeremiah 3, 4 just says, have you not now called me my father? You are a friend of my youth. And I don't know why they put that one verse in there just to end it off. But after this, we go to the gospel uh, portion of today, which is going to be Luke 13 to start. So head on over to Luke 13. I'm wondering if this is the, the Sukkot thing that I was just talking about. Luke 13. Um, here we go. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? 
No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Okay, if you go back to the section we were reading in Jeremiah, it's talking, he was also talking about a vine and how um, some people have become a wild vine. The people that had come into the kingdom, they were given a good vine, but instead they become a wild vine. And so they're not producing good fruit. And so we go back to this one where Yeshua is saying, uh, the vine dresser is saying, he's giving you the parable of the vine dresser where he's saying, um, for three years, he's been trying to seek fruit, good fruit on this vine tree, and he's not finding any, cut it down. But why should he use it? And so then he's saying, let it alone for one for this year also. So one more year, and I'll dig around it and put on manure. And then it should bear fruit the next year. And if not, you should cut it down. Okay. If you go and look up the Levitical law of fruit trees, you see the same picture, the Levitical law of fruit trees. Um, in the Levitical law of fruit trees, you are not supposed to eat of the fruit of a nearly newly acquired tree for three years. And then the fourth year, that fruit that that tree produces is given directly to Yehovah. And so the next year, if the, the vine produces good fruit, then all of the congregation can partake of the vine. Okay, um, This is the same picture being painted here. And now we ought to, if we want to look at this metaphorically, we want to look at our walks as believers, right? For three years, um, the vine dresser dresses us. He tries to produce good fruit from us. And it takes about three years three years of walking with Yeshua. And then he starts to produce the, you know, the, the fruit starts to come out, right? And then on the fourth year, all that fruit should be given. You should be giving it directly to Yehovah and he's going to nurture you and, and do more of that. And then the fifth year is when the other people can start partaking of the fruit. Now, often we see these new believers and they get into this stuff and they go out and they start sharing what they're learning, sharing what they're, what they're, you know, not just sharing their testimony, but trying to teach. Now they're trying to teach from a place where they have not been, um, they have not been dealt with by the vine dresser yet, right? As you go through this walk, you will come across many things and you will think you know something, you think you have something figured it out. And then two years from then, you'll be like, wow, was I ever an idiot, right? I've done this many, many times where I've gone and I've like, oh, I've got this figured out. Oh, this, this certain thing, that's really cool. I know the exact name of Yehovah or, you know, something like that. People get really on these, these, these tangents about it and they think they have it all figured out. And that's a sign, number one, if you think you've got it all figured out, you need to humble yourself because none of us have it all figured out. That's for sure. Um, so this is the, the picture that he's trying to show us is that as, as people, as fruit trees, we're supposed to be um, addressing our own fruit for quite a while. And then addressing our fruit between us and Yehovah for quite a while. And then you can share your fruit because he wants to make sure before he sends you out to feed other people, he wants to make sure that your fruit is good and you need to see that your fruit is good and you need to be tried and tested. Okay. So I definitely, I definitely encourage you to speak, uh, to engage carefully with people who are very new to the walk or very new to anything. Um, their testimony is a great thing to listen to. What they've gone through personally is a great thing to listen to. But anyone teaching, trying to teach you stuff that is pretty new to the walk, they're usually just quoting stuff that they saw on YouTube or they're quoting stuff that they heard other people say. It's not that they have actually gone through these cycles of the word and they've gone through. Like what we're doing today is something that, that, that believers do weekly 
they read the Torah portions, they go through it, they sift through it, they see new things. And that should be something done weekly for three, four years before you start trying to instruct anybody on anything, right? Um, it, it needs to come from a very humble place that you don't have it figured out. We're all just in this together trying to figure it out, right? Um, so yeah, I just wanna just offer that bit of warning. Um, you see it a lot in kind of like the Hebrew roots um, movement and you see a lot in Christians as well, um, where people, you know, they come across a YouTube video and it really inspires them to take a point of view, um, but they haven't really sat with it and wrestled with it and spent time practicing what they've learned. Um, and then they go out and they, they throw stones at everybody who doesn't hold their point of view, right? The name is a really good example. Like these people that think they've figured out the name, you know, perfectly and all of this ancient Hebrew perfectly. And so they go out and they throw stones at everybody who doesn't agree with them. Um, a lot, a lot of times these people have only just watched a bunch of YouTube videos. They haven't spent time in the word. They haven't spent time in prayer. They haven't really mulled and meditated this stuff over. They haven't asked father for wisdom on it. Um, they've just kind of jumped on a bandwagon. Okay. So just be really aware of that. It's all about balance and it's all about you. So you don't need me to walk you through this. I just do this because I think it's it's interesting and I think it motivates you because you see me on here and then you're like oh I'm motivated to have this conversation about the Torah today um, but you don't need me to learn this stuff you can sift through it you can walk through it with Yehovah by yourself and you can look up these Hebrew words you know the internet is amazing right the internet is evil in so many ways but it's also amazing in Exodus uh, I think it was I think it was in numbers actually when they go into the land he says that when they when they go into the land, he says that everything that they that they have planted, you will use. You will you will use their vineyards. You will use their infrastructure, right? So a lot of times people really look at a lot of stuff like that's evil. That's evil. We can't touch it. We can't be a part of that. Well, everything that as we go into the land, as we go into just these different portions of the land, everything that the enemy has created for evil, we can turn into good. He, he created, maybe, maybe the enemy was behind a whole, all the internet stuff, and he, um, and he created this, uh, you know, internet to destroy people, to bring pornography into people's houses and all this stuff. Maybe the enemy did that, but we can use it for good. We can come on here and, and make sure the word gets out and make sure all of that happens, right? Okay, I'm rambling. Mark 11, uh, verse 12 to 23. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who stole pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Okay, uh, I just want to address what Angelica said about some people using the excuse that Xmas uh, from some denominations is them sowing seeds of good. Um, so there is a direct command for us to not worship Jehovah in the way that uh, the pagans worship their gods. So, you know, there's no direct command that says I can't use the internet and communicate to you guys from this platform, right? Um, so if there is a direct command that tells us to do something or to not do something. So with Xmas, there's several direct commands that are being, um, 
broken. Number one, worshiping Yehovah in the way that the pagans worship their gods. And number two, uh, people that keep Xmas don't usually, I don't think, I don't know anyone that keeps Xmas and keeps Sukkot. We are commanded to keep the Feast of Sukkot. We're commanded to save up our money and invest our money um, into the Feast of Sukkot and take that as our holiday. Now, I live in an area that is not Jewish um, at all. And so because if we want time off or time to go get away, um, you know, the whole of our society is based around getting away during Xmas. I always want to get away at Sukkot, obviously, and do Sukkot properly and really, really well. And I can't. It's well, I can, but it's a battle, right? Like it's always a battle every single year because, you know, that is not the time where these things in our society has been has been made to make it easy for us to keep this feast of Sukkot, but it's been made very easy for us to keep um, Xmas if we wanted to keep Xmas as our feast, right? Which obviously I do not want to do. So uh, yeah, you know, Jehovah, has, Jehovah says that we can use the infrastructure that's been put into place, but there's also commands that say, don't worship me in this way, do this, do, don't do that. And so we never want to be breaking one of those commands. Um, Right. So I might want to eat from someone's vineyard, but if that vineyard is owned by another Israelite, I wouldn't steal from their vineyard and eat from it. Right. Because that would be breaking command. If that makes sense. Um, so I want to talk quickly. I just want to cover the fig tree and the symbols here. Um, so the fig tree is a picture of a vine not producing fruit. So the fruit was not being produced from the particular vine. So that's why he cursed the fig tree is some it's a symbol of that the temple was not producing good fruit right and so he's alluding to th this whole thing is not producing good fruit i'm cursing it it's going to be um it's going to wither and die which it did right the temple withered and died shortly after um and then obviously right after that he goes and he cleanses the temple and he says my father's house will be a house of prayer so he's cleansing out those i think we talked about this last week um, in the Luke portion about how um, many people say that those, those um, money changers were in the Gentile section of the temple. So there's, there's the, the Gentiles court, and then there's, um, the Gentiles can't go into the temple. If you're not an Israelite, you're not um, circumcised um, physically, you would not be able to go into the temple gates, right? And so the Gentiles would come to the temple to draw near to Jehovah, and the money changers were going, were taking their offerings in order to buy um, animals and that to, so they were going to make an offering to Jehovah, but they needed to do it through the Levites and through the Aaronic priesthood, um, or whoever was running the temple at the time. There's questions about that, but I'm not going to get into that today. Um, so, so... The money changers, a lot of people say that they were in the Gentiles court and there's a certain, there's certain sects of the Pharisees that didn't believe that Gentiles had a portion, a portion in the afterlife. So they thought it was a waste for Gentiles to even be offering offerings to Jehovah. Um, so what the money changers were doing apparently was taking the money from the Gentiles but never making the offerings on their behalf. They were never going into, they were never making sure that the animals were bought and brought into the temple and made, and that prayer was offered and that offering was offered on behalf of the Gentile that came to them and paid them. But they were taking the money, right? Because these people did not believe that Gentiles had a portion in the afterlife. Um, we did discuss this, I believe, last week as well. And so, you know, the gospel goes out to the Gentiles as well. It goes out to all the nations and anyone who repents and wants to draw near to Israel can be a part of that, right? Um, and we see that obviously throughout scripture. We even see that in the Old Testament um, that those of the nations, there's people in Exodus who left with the Israelites who were Egyptians. They were still brought into the commonwealth of Israel. If you read in Isaiah 6, uh, 56 it says do not say that you are not you are not brought near you are brought near to the house of israel you're part of the family and we've gone through that in jeremiah 2 where we talked about how uh in jeremiah 2 where we talked about how the people were brought into the community and so they needed to behave 
with the way that the community operated, right? Um, so that is all for today. Oh, I want to talk about the mountain, actually, the mountain, because a lot of people look at this verse and they're like, I should be able to speak to a mountain and the mountain should move. Mountains in scripture are uh, mountains of doctrine, okay? It's, it's not him saying literally you can speak to this mountain. And yes, we could look at it a mountain of our problems, mountain of challenges in our lives. But he's, he's talking because, because of the context, we know that he's talking about the mountains of doctrine. So the Jewish uh, temple at that time had a mountain of doctrine that it was built on, right? And it was not producing good fruit. This mountain of doctrine that, had been, that, that all this had been built on was not producing good fruit. That is what we're seeing in the, in the order of these, the order of these um, parables, right? And so he's saying, if you speak to the mountain of this doctrine and you, sh and you speak to it, that mountain of doctrine will be removed, which we have seen in the world, right? People have spot, have spoken the gospel. They have spoken out what Yeshua did. They have spoken out the drawing near of the Gentiles. And that mountain has been moved, right? That mountain has been moved and that is what he's talking about he's not talking about that you should go speak to a mountain and the mountain's actually going to physically move maybe you can do that maybe some of you can um please record it if you can i would love to see it okay bless you all love you um i'm going to stop the recording and if you have any questions feel free to ask away